It is a great privilege to be invited to address this distinguished gathering in this beautiful town. Even the weather has been very kind. And I thank the organizers for giving me this privilege of addressing all of you. I'm going to talk about is it okay? No. I do. Is that better? Yes. Oh. It's your voice. Thank you. <laughs> Is it okay? Yes. Uh, I'm going to talk about state, religion, and law in India. A major challenge facing our century is accommodating cultural and religious diversity within a state without sacrificing the identity and values distinctive of that state. Is it possible to have a constitutional and legal structure which guarantees human rights to all and at the same time protects customs, practices and laws which are religious or tribal in origin. Tradition and religion are frequently used by a state to override its human rights obligations, especially towards minorities and women. Cultural relativism is put forth as a reason for denying universality of human rights. Cultural and religious diversity within a state makes compliance with human rights even more complicated. With the globalization of the economy, almost instant communications, and easy movement of people across countries with unprecedented rapidity, there is now no time for gradual assimilation of differences amongst people. And most nations now have to deal with ethno-cultural diversity. How does one accommodate such diversity and what extent? How far should differences be recognized by the legal system? Should the migrants carry with them their own laws and customs? I hope the struggles of India will provide some guidance on the law's ability to accommodate cultural and religious diversity while remaining, retaining secular values based on human rights as understood nationally and internationally. The state's ability in a multicultural and multi-religious society to render justice in its fullest sense to all depends on this. While multiculturalism is new to Western societies, which have been in the past culturally homogeneous, Asian countries have had to deal with multiculturalism dating back to several centuries. All of the major ethical and religious traditions in the Asian region, from Confucian and Buddhist to Islamic and Hindu, have their own conceptions of the value of tolerance, and their own recipes for sustaining unity amidst diversity. The Sanskrit phrase, Sarva Dharma Samabhava, meaning equal respect for all religions, and the Upanishadic saying, Ano Badraha Hutabha Yantu Vishwata, which means let good thoughts come from all over the world. These are indicative of the spirit of tolerance. India is home to Hindus, Muslims, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, Buddhists, Jains, Sikhs, and Baha'is. One of the oldest Jewish settlements in Kochi in southern India traces its ancestry to the Jews exiled by King Nebuchadnezzar. Another version dates the arrival of Jews in India even earlier to the days of King Solomon. 
The Jews were granted a kingdom in a Kerala village by the local king in 379 AD for meritorious service. The origins of Christianity in India date back to the arrival of St. Thomas the Apostle in 52 AD. The largest settlement of Baha'is, the newest, so to speak, contemporary religion is also in India. Hinduism, the oldest religion in the world, is the religion of the majority. It has no single holy book. Its religious philosophy is multidimensional and it has no structured religious order. The tradition of tolerance is fundamental to Hinduism and has enabled other religions to find a home in India. India became a single political entity in 1947 after the departure of the British and the subsequent merger of princely states. When a separate state was carved out by the British for Muslims on the basis of religion amidst unprecedented bloodshed, India vowed to be secular. At present, 11% of its population is Muslim and it is the second largest in the world in numbers after Indonesia. Subsecularism, when the constitution was promulgated in 1950, freedom of religion was granted to everybody and India decided to call itself a secular democracy. Now, secularism can have more than one thing. It can mean one, that the state shall not have any official religion as a corollary, sorry, uh, as a corollary, there will not be any religion in the public sphere. Two, it can mean that there shall be no state preference for any religion. And three, all religions can be practiced and public manifestations of all religions are permissible. So India has secularism in all its aspects. Article 25 of the Indian Constitution guarantees freedom of conscience and the right freely to profess, practice and propagate religion. It permits, it permits wearing of items of religious significance such as a kirpan by the Sikhs or a cross by the Christians. The wearing of a veil or burqa has not been an issue. People have the freedom to dress in the way they like and they do. And the existence of minority schools and colleges has probably provided an alternative to Muslim women and girls who prefer to wear a burqa. Then Articles 14, 15, and 16 provide for equality before the law and equal protection of the laws for everybody. These articles provide that there will be no discrimination between persons on various grounds, including on the ground of religion. But Article 15 also provides that you can make special provisions for the protection of women and children. Under Article 19, there is freedom of speech and expression for all. This right, however, is subject to reasonable restrictions. Among other grounds, on the ground of public order, decency, morality, and incitement to an offense. Hate speech deliberately made with intent to outrage religious feelings of any class of citizens or to insult religious beliefs is an offence under section 295A of the Penal Code. Thus all religious groups are dealt with in the same fashion. So you can have a public debate to express your doubts and criticism about a religious belief, but not just to malign it. The study of religions and religious philosophy is permissible in state-run institutions 
but the imparting, imparting of religious instructions is not permissible under Article 28. The minorities, the minorities, including religious minorities, have the right to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice under Article 30. So it's a very complex structure of human rights and the task of enforcing these fundamental rights as they are called and dissolving con conflicts between them because there can be conflicts between different fundamental rights, this task has fallen on the higher judiciary of the country. Now India was faced with a major problem in giving recognition to the right to equality and non-discrimination on the ground of race, religion, caste, sex, or this birth. And the legal structure in India had uniform laws applicable to most secular activities such as commerce, banking, company law, property rights, law of contract, and so on. Both economic and penal laws are secular. However, there are personal laws, such as the law of marriage and divorce, inheritance and succession, custody of children, maintenance, guardianship, adoption, and the like, where the law administered depends on the religion of the parties. Hindus have Hindu law, Muslims have Muslim law based on Sharia written in India, Christians have their own separate statutory law, Parsis or Russians have separate laws. The Jews in India are governed by Jewish law in, this, in these spheres. In 1925, you might be interested to know, in the case of Benjamin versus Benjamin, the Bombay High Court examined what that law is as applicable to divorce claim by a Jew. And the court said that the Jewish law is founded on the Mosaic and Talmudic law, but in the 16th century, that law was codified in Shulchan Aruch. The substance of matrimonial law in the third part of that work is reproduced in Dr. Mir Zainer's book, Jewish Law of Marriage and Divorce, and this was followed by the court. Then Justice Madan's judgment in 1968 in Solomon versus Solomon has also given a very clear exposition of Jewish law as applicable in India. I have copies of two of the judgments. Uh, they are available on the desk for those who are interested. <laughs> Laws which are based on religion usually reflect the social values of a past age. Such laws usually have a built-in inequality between men and women. You heard that yesterday also. None of the personal laws provide equal treatment for men and women. And there is also no equal treatment of persons professing different faiths because they are governed by different laws. Article 13 of the Constitution, however, provided that all laws in force immediately before the commencement of the Constitution, in so far as they are inconsistent with the provisions relating to fundamental rights in the Constitution, which includes equality, will be void to that extent. So the first challenge as soon as the Constitution was promulgated in 1951, was to personal laws. If all laws in force which are contrary to the right to equality are void, then are personal laws valid after the Constitution came into force? The courts took the view that personal laws were not covered by Article 13. Only statutory laws were so covered, and the court said that inequality within personal laws will have to be eliminated by law reform through legislation by power. And the law has been consistently of that view. 
The Constitution, however, directed under Article 44 that there should be a uniform civil code applicable to all irrespective of religion. But this was only a directive and not an enforceable right. So, although this was a major demand during the freedom struggle, this has not happened. Thus, when also, if you remember, when India signed the CEDAW Treaty, that's the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, India entered a caveat to the effect that it will not change the personal laws of any religious group unless the group asks for a change in the law. And this demand from religious minorities has taken a long time to become vocal. Legislative reform has been slow. However, Hindu law being the law of the majority was the first to be amended after the constitution came into force. And in 1955 and 56, four major laws were enacted, changing Hindu law fundamentally by giving to women equal rights, which they did not possess earlier. However, the process is not complete even now. Customs and customary law are difficult to change. They have had to be abolished by specific statutes and not through the application of human rights treaties as embodied in the Constitution. In this respect, the Indian Constitution is more conservative than the constitutions of some of the African countries where the Constitution prevails over customary law. Thus, for example, we have had to enact the Dowry Prohibition Acts in 1961 and in 1986. In 2005, after half a century, Hindu law had again to be amended by giving daughters a share in the joint family property by birth. So even for Hindu law, this is still an ongoing process. In Vishakha versus uh, State of Rajasthan in 1997, the Supreme Court held that when there was an absence of laws, international treaties on human rights signed by India can be used legally to fill the gap. And in that case, that was a case of sexual harassment. This can also be looked at as an attempt to harmonize national legal system with international human rights law. <coughs> the legal changes have been accepted by the community but the social changes have been slow in coming. The, in, for the religious minorities, the government took the view that unless the demand for reform came from the group, the government will not change the law. Of course, the process of incorporating equality in the rights of minorities has therefore been slow, but at the same time it ensures when the law is amended, it is acceptable to the minority. Now, the Mohammedan law in India is based on Sharia as applied in India. There is no separate penal law for Muslims, and the law of commerce and banking also does not recognize religious differences. The Sharia law, as applied in India, was developed in the British courts by hearing the mullahs, the so-called experts on Muslim law. As a result, there has been a more conservative interpretation of Muslim law as applicable in India. For example, uh, the right of a Muslim man to divorce his wife without having to give any reasons for the same, simply by pronouncing the lack thrice has been upheld. Even the presence of a woman is not necessary to divorce her. The law has also denied to a Muslim woman on divorce anything more than the contractual amount, Baha'i. 
specified under the marriage contract. And in India, traditionally, this has been a very nominal amount. There are also inequalities under Muslim law in respect of inheritance. Although Muslim law was one of the first laws to recognize women as heirs, but the share of a woman is half that of her male counterpart. The issue of equality in the personal laws of the Muslims is linked to two sets of conflicting fundamental rights under the Constitution, namely equality and non-discrimination on the ground of sex and the constitutional protection given to minorities to preserve their tradition and culture. Now, as is usually the case, in the name of tradition and culture, what is often protected is unequal treatment of women and their vulnerability. But the law relating to the majority community could be quickly made more egalitarian. This has not been possible for the minority. For example, uh, in the area of maintenance, the Muslim law permits maintenance being given to a divorced Muslim woman only during the period of Iddat, that is three months. In the, it has become a very famous case in India, in the famous Shah Bano case in 1985, the Supreme Court tried to help the divorced Muslim woman by giving her the benefit of a secular law, Section 125 of the Criminal Procedure Code, which permits maintenance being given to a divorced woman to prevent destitution. The protests from the Orthodox Muslim groups calling such grant of maintenance un-Islamic led to a very hasty enactment of a law ironically called the Muslim Women Protection on Divorce Act, 1986, which explicitly denied to Muslim women any right to maintenance beyond the Iddat period under any law. Now the constitutional, there was a constitutional challenge to this law and the Supreme Court dismissed the challenge by giving a very curious interpretation to this law. It said that under this act, a reasonable and fair provision for maintenance has to be made within the end of period, but this amount must take care of her needs for her entire life. So, so this is how, through court intervention, some relief has been given, but any major change has not been possible so far. Now the Christians were covered, you will be surprised to know, by a highly gender unequal law of divorce, which dated back to 1869. And it was finally amended in 1998 to bring it in line with the civil law of divorce and giving women equal rights as men. Then, in Mary Roy's case, she is the mother of, you might have heard of Arundhati Roy, who won the Booker Prize. Mary Roy was her mother. And she was affected by a pre-independence succession law for Christians in the state, in the former state of Travancore, which denied to Christian women equal right of inheritance. And the court said that this law is no longer valid after the constitution came into force and she's entitled to equal rights. So the Christian law has been reformed partly by legislation and partly by judicial intervention. The Parsi law of marriage and divorce of 1936 could be amended only in 1988 to provide for more broad-based grounds of divorce similar to the other communities. And as a result, now the matrimonial law of all religious communities except the Muslims has become similar. The Parsi law of inheritance has also been amended to give in 1991. So you can see how long it has taken to change the laws. And it now grants to daughters the same share as a son. 
as religious minority. Now I'll come to some other aspects of uh, protection of minorities. Under Article 30, a religious minority has the right to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice. This has been interpreted by the courts as giving to the minorities the right to establish educational institutions which may impart either religious instruction or secular instruction. And in fact, some of the best schools in the country are run by Christian missionaries. If these institutions, you can see the fine balancing which has given rise to considerable litigation. Now, if these institutions, by run by minorities, receive aid from the state, most educational institutions do need some aid from the state, then they cannot deny admission to anyone on the ground of religion, race, caste, or language. However, in the TMFI Foundation case, the Supreme Court laid down that even if a minority educational institution receives state funding, it is entitled to preserve its minority character and may give preferential admission on a reasonable basis to students belonging to that minority. But they cannot deny admission to the other religious communities. The process of enacting uniform laws which apply to all and which are constitution in letter and spirit is for India an ongoing process. To persuade the minorities to modify their customary religious laws in order to secure to them their constitutional rights is difficult. All minorities except the Muslims have had their laws modified or altered, and as a result, they have brought their laws in conformity with fundamental rights. But the extremists among the Muslims, I'm afraid, have prevented reasonable changes being made in their personal laws, even in conformity with their own religion, as the Shah Bhanavis shows. In fact, such elements have encouraged a greater display of diversity, such as more Muslim women, wearing a burqa. This can be described as a display of identity or a display of diversity, depending upon your point of view. This extremist trend needs to be checked and one hopes that an open society which gives freedom to express one's views will tilt the balance in favor of what is reasonable without being antithetical towards own religion. And even for the majority, I will repeat, reforms in personal laws has not been easy. It's very difficult to get rid of customs. As I told you, the practice of dowry is prevalent even now, despite law, and some of the minorities also have this practice. The modern practice of female feticides has led to an enactment of an act to prevent sex determination tests on pregnant women. <laughs> Basic questions. I've just concluded. Should one wait for social acceptance before enacting or amending personal laws? This may delay or even postpone indefinitely much needed legal changes. On the <coughs> other hand, the promulgation of a law against, for example, a prevailing custom is itself a strong signal that a custom is unacceptable and penalties provided in the law for its violation can put a stop to such practices. And the law itself educates the community that a practice is wrong. Thus, a speedy enactment of a proper law may accelerate the requisite change in social behavior. However, an unwanted law may result simply in its evasion. So we have had an ongoing debate on this issue for the last 60 years and more. India now seems to have reached 
a compromise solution. One needs both the existence of a movement for social reform, and at the same time, one must have legal reform without waiting for an overwhelming demand for it. The enactment of PNDP Act, Domestic Violence Act, etc., are examples of this kind of compromise. But these do not deal with personal laws. But I hope that this approach will be used to deform personal laws that need change, including Muslim personal law. I also believe that the movement for a fundamental social transformation has started. The right to education and the right to information are both now enforceable, justiciable rights. These should help all religious groups to critically examine their laws and bring their personal laws in harmony with human rights as embodied in the Indian Constitution. This requires education, support for liberal views within the community, and a healthy debate to decide how equality, can, how equality can be generated, where diversity is acceptable in culture and behavior, and where it is not, and how one can practice one's religion without compromising human rights as we now understand it. It also means tolerance and understanding of another person's point of view to be able to accept diversities. I hope that the example of India will show that this synthesis between religion and human values in law is possible and it is necessary. Thank you very much.